Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm at the television studios of the school district of Lee County, and with me today is Kate Nesda. And Kate, where do you work? I work at the Hardy County Outdoor Classroom in Wachula, Florida. Wonderful. All right, I see some of y'all are back. Some of you I saw here a little while ago, we were talking about phosphate mining. Now we're going to talk some more about it. Today, phosphate mines, like we said, are surface mines. The dirt over the phosphate is moved out of the way, and the phosphate is dug up. Some of the large leftover holes are reclaimed as lakes, and engineered earthen dams store clay particles separated from the phosphate. Like agriculture, power generating utilities, and cities, the phosphate industry historically consumed much groundwater and may have helped cause kitchens and springs to dry up during the 1950s. Well, before 1975, when stricter laws were passed, some mine land was not reclaimed and several spills polluted the Peace River and its tributaries. Today, the industry must meet state and federal water quality standards. It has dramatically reduced its water usage by recycling 95% of the water at mining sites. Reclaimed mines can be used for agriculture, parks, wetlands, lakes, and housing developments. Some of the land has been donated to the public so that the public can enjoy it, like the Peace River, parts of the Peace River, there's a park there on the side of it donated, and there are public fishing lakes and parks. And I, I think, Carol, we have a picture right here behind us that is a picture of Hardy Lakes Park, which was donated by the Mosaic Company to, to Hardy County of about 1,000, I think it was over 1,000 acres of land, and it has four lakes on it and got good fishing in it, so you can come down there and go fishing sometime. That, that sounds wonderful. Now, why did Hardy County decide that they wanted to have the lakes rather than have the holes that the phosphate mining had dug filled in? Well, see, what happens is that about a third of the land that they dig up is actual phosphate, okay? So when you take a third of something away, you're going to have big holes left. Well, now, you can do like in the old days, which they don't do this no more, but back in the old days, they just leave it there, and it, it looked bad for a long, long, long time. But then in 1975, they passed laws saying that all of the land has to be reclaimed, and that means put back to a useful purpose. So there are a lot of different useful purposes. You could reclaim it, and you could put cows out there on it, you could put orange groves on it, you could put houses on it, you could put parks on it. Well, Hardy County doesn't have any lakes. Not a single natural lake in Hardy County. So the people in Hardy County said, if you give us a chance to have some lakes, we'll take it. And so what they did was they reclaimed that land so that we now have four lakes out there that we can go out and go boating on, go fishing on, and enjoy the natural setting. That is just wonderful. Thank you so much for being with me here today, Kate, and I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. And I hope to see you guys again a little bit later. Swimming downstream, Missy enters a swamp. Bald cypress trees stand tall above the water. Streamers of Spanish moss hang from their branches. An egret perches on a cypress knee. It dips into the water and catches a mosquito fish. Missy eats one too. The fish, as small as a guppy, eats the larvae of mosquitoes. A hurricane in 2004 blew down branches and trees. Missy hides beneath one and another as the ground becomes more mud than water. She follows the rise of the land toward the scent of sun-baked sand and plants. Missy wiggles through Virginia creeper and swamp fern. She sees a sidewalk. Across the road is a tall hill. It is taller than the riverbank or a cypress tree. Missy hears footsteps and dogs panting. She hides in the ferns. A woman holds her son's hand. She tells him, That big hill where we parked used to be a clay settling and from a phosphate mine. It's dried up now, but when it was first made, the watery stuff inside it was really yucky. My friend told me that one time some of it leaked into the water, into the river. It killed all the fish. 
A man holding the leashes of two dogs says, Pardon me, ma'am. It's what they now call reclaimed. Dogs pull toward the boy. Don't worry. These dogs won't hurt you. Then he turns to the mother. The hills planted in the grass, and it makes a big open field. The dogs love it. Dogs sniff the ground, pulling against their leashes. They whine towards Missy. She holds still. The man says, You should walk the boardwalk. It winds through the swamp to the river. She says, There's only about... There's only about an hour of daylight left. You have time to walk to the river. You'll want to stop and look at everything. You can, you can even see the high water mark on the tree trunks. The man pulls on the leashes. The dogs bark and whine and tug harder. I will, thanks. She smiles at him. He yanks the leashes. Come on, boys, he says to the dogs. Before she turns to the river, Missy waits until the footsteps fade away. For centuries, people have crossed Peace River at Fort Meade. Today, U.S. Highway 98 bridges the river, and hickory trees grow on the banks. As Missy passes under the bridge, a nut falls near her. When it rises to the surface, she bats it down. It pops up again as they float together. At the boat ramp, three men are fishing. One rests the end of his fishing pole on the ground. A brim dangles at the end of his line. So far, only stump knockers and too smart to keep, he says. He works the hook free and tosses the fish. It lands in the water not far from Missy. The fish is the right size for her. She dives and catches it in her teeth. She drags it up on the bank beneath a tangle of twigs. She tears it into chunks as she eats it. Another man catches a fish and the pole bends. He reels it in. The fish sways at the end of his line. Look here, a walking catfish. A third man says, You're kidding. I didn't think they'd gotten this one on. He sips coffee from a styrofoam cup with a plastic cover. The man with the catfish says, I've been catching them for years. I remember back in the 1960s when they first got loose. It was from a fish farm or truck north of Miami. I hear they'll eat anything. Third man sips his coffee again. Sure enough, and they can live in the muddiest water and they'll eat everything in a puddle and then walk to the next one. The first man explains. The man slips off the plastic cover, drains the last of the coffee, and then fits the top on again. He walks up the ramp, tosses it into a trash can, and then returns. You gonna let him go? No way. Tastes just like a regular old Florida catfish. Maybe better. Wearing a glove, he holds the fish. He slips the hook from its mouth. He tosses it into a bucket half full of water. Drops splash all around. Missy swallows the last bit of fish. She dives into the river and moves south with the current. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm in the television studios of the school district of Lee County. And with me today is Melissa Nell Kane. Hi, Carol. Hello, Melissa. Well, I'm glad to be joining you all today. I work up in Manatee County for the Natural Resources Department, and today I'm going to talk to you about something that we work with probably every day, just about, and that is exotic and invasive species. And before we start, we'll just take a little poll. How many of you guys out there were born in the state of Florida? I was. Were you, Carol? No, I'm not. Oh, well, I am a native, and Carol, because she was born someplace else, is an exotic. <laughs> it's okay though. It works the same way with people and plants and animals. If you were born in Florida, you're a Florida native. Plants and animals can be natives too, if they live here naturally. Plants and animals that grow naturally elsewhere but have been brought to Florida are called exotics. Often, these species have no predators or other environmental controls and they quickly multiply and take over. When an exotic competes with native plants and animals for food, 
water, shelter, and space, it's called an invasive species. Because of its tropical climate, Florida is a paradise for exotic species, and we have lots of them. We have Brazilian pepper tree, melaleuca tree from Australia, air potato vine, which is right behind me right there. You've probably seen it growing everywhere. We have different types of pasture grass, hydrilla, water hyacinth, wild hog, iguana, European starlings, house sparrow, walking catfish, and fire ants. And that's just a few of the species that we have. Thanks for reading that, Melissa. And I think we tried to list the, the species that were particularly in the book. And right. it's really interesting that right on the front cover of the book is a water hyacinth. That's right, right there. Absolutely. Now, now, you know a story about how the water hyacinth came to Florida. I do. And you know, Carol, this is what happens with a lot of exotics. And any of you all who have ever had a really cool pet, or maybe your mom or dad has had a really cool plant that they liked, can, might be able to sort of see how this could happen. If you look how pretty that water hyacinth is, what I heard was there was a woman and she got some water hyacinth and she thought it was the most beautiful plant she'd ever seen. The leaves are kind of curly and they're green and it has this beautiful spike of purple flowers. So she brought it home and she put it in her pond and she thought, this is the most beautiful plant ever. I should share it with all her friends. So she did. She gave it to all of her friends who had water, and they put it in their pond. But what they didn't realize was nothing in Florida eats the water hyacinth. And it quickly grew, and all the ponds she spread it to, it clogged up pretty fast. And today, we have water hyacinth all across the state of Florida. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. It is a story, but it's a really good example of one of the ways exotics are spread. Now, the state of Florida spends a lot of money every year trying to eradicate invasive and exotic species. We do, and it's, it's a really great example of teamwork because it's not just one organization spending money. I work for a county organization, so we do a lot with exotics, but we also partner up with state and even nonprofit agencies and school kids like you. We have a lot of kids that come out and they help us do battle against the exotics by doing things like hand pulling them out of the ground. Now, what if I have, see, an exotic plant, for example, in my own yard? Well, if you see an exotic plant in your yard, you really should try to get it out because just one plant, remember, they can grow very fast. Usually there's nothing else that would want to eat them, so they're going to spread pretty quickly because nothing's going to control them. And some of our animals, like birds, really love to eat those seeds and spread them further. Sometimes, though, it can be kind of hard to tell which one's which. So there's lots of good resources online. If you type in F-L-E-E-P-C, or CISMA, or just Florida exotic animals or plants. Lots of resources will come up for you. Well, Melissa, thanks for talking with me today. I've really enjoyed it. It was my pleasure. See you guys next time. Missy Pass is an oak tree that curves into the water. At first, it seems that a branch is moving, but it is a water moccasin. Quickly, Missy swims away. She dives between the twigs of, of a submerged branch. The snake pushes through just behind her. She swims to the bottom and wiggles beneath a sunken log. She surprises a snapping turtle hiding in the mud, waiting to catch a fish. The turtle swims up. It blocks the snake's path and the snake turns away. It moves as easy as a ripple of water. Later, Missy drifts beside a floating branch under the twin bridges of U.S. Highway 17 in Zolfo Springs. They mark the north end of Pioneer Park. A nature trail leads from the pavilion to the boat ramp. Two women walk as fast as the current carries Missy. One asks, Have you been inside the Cracker Trail Museum? Not yet. The other one says, My husband and I walked around last evening when we arrived. We saw the blacksmith shop, post office, and the heart cabin. I can't believe that it was built in 1879. I know what you mean. She laughs. We also walked by the Hardy County Animal Refuge, but it was closed. Have you been inside? It's great. They have animals that are hard to see in the wild. A panther and a black bear. Do they have alligators? She laughs. I see alligators all the time but not in the refuge.
She sweeps her arm from side to side. Just look at the river. The other woman sees and points at Missy. There's a little one. You're right, and I don't know that I've ever seen one that, so that small. That's the first one I've seen, and I'm happy it's a baby. The women turn away from the river at the boat ramp. Two men unload canoes. A group of boys and their fathers stand near. They zip on life vests and hold paddles. Beside them are coolers, tents, and other gear. As Missy swims under the State Road 64 bridge, she leaves the park. For free classroom materials, please visit our website at www.chnep.org.